This video is sponsored by Synthetic Notes. Synthetic Notes was created by a software engineer and small business owner called Liam, who works a lot with CNC machines. While working one day, he used a note-taking app to take notes on the various machine parts. He shared these notes with a relative, and later he and his relative noticed that they were getting flooded with adverts for CNC machine parts. He realized that the company that made the free app was collecting data from the notes in the app and selling it to advertising companies. So he sat down and used his skills to make his own app. It is the app you are seeing right here. I use it when making videos to take research notes and to write book lists. And the reason I use this app ever since I got it is because I do not want to get flooded with adverts related to the things I'm researching. When, for example, I'm taking notes on a book that I'm reading, I no longer get adverts for a book that I already own. Essentially, by buying this app, you are paying for digital privacy, something that many falsely take for granted. Liam kept the first version of this app as minimalist as possible, but it does intend to add optional features free of charge in the coming year, including making a version for phones and expanding the text features in the app. All the data is stored on your own device rather than on some cloud, and there are no monthly fees for the use of this app. You only pay once and then you get to use the app indefinitely. I did not know until meeting Liam that monthly subscription apps use a monthly check-in to grab data from you and save it in their cloud. Therefore, you can trust Synthetic Notes because you do not have to. The app and the business model are literally designed in a way that it can't collect any of your data. If you are interested, there's a link in the description or you just directly go to syntheticapps.com slash kraut and use the discount code kraut at checkout to get 25% off your purchase. Synthetic apps will be creating a lot more apps that are specifically designed to protect your privacy, and I look forward to promoting this cause in the future. When you read outdated history and political science books, you will sometimes find the term Eurocratic state. This term was used by historians, anthropologists and political scientists to describe the concept of the state. And the state, in their worldview, was something that Europeans had invented in ancient Greece. But we know today that this is incorrect. The first states were created by someone else, and if we were to use an accurate term, it should be the Sinocratic state. Ancient China as a term refers to five eras of Chinese history, the Yangshao period and Longshan period from 500 BC to 3000 BC are largely archaeological with close to no written reliable records. The Three Dynasties period from 2000 to 700 BC with the Xia, Shang and Western Zhu dynasties, the Spring and Autumn period from 770 to 460 BC and the Warring States period from 460 to 220. BC. During the Xia dynasty is when we started to see the first state structures of China emerge. Less states as we know and understand it, but more little fiefdoms of family clans that organized their own little states with ever increasing centralization. This is not to be understood as a sudden transformation, but a slow and gradual process taking place over centuries. By the late Zhu period, these states started to establish large bureaucracies, collected taxes, introduced currencies, organized standing armies and used standardized measurements and units. The political force that drove the shaping of the first Chinese state was however not internal political or economical development, but war. During the spring and autumn period, which lasted 294 years, 1,211 wars were fought with only 38 total years of peace and the destruction and conquest of 110 individual state entities. In the following 254 years of the Warring States period, the remaining 23 state entities continued to fight 468 wars with only 89 total years of peace and the destruction of 16 state entities, with only 7 remaining. 
These 548 years of constant war are unique in human history for their duration and the enormous numbers of peoples killed. While Rome was still a collection of huts, tens of thousands were dying in China as ever-efficient state organizations sent standing armies into battles in attempts to dominate over all of China. The way this period shaped China can be almost understood in Darwinian terms of the evolutionary process. Chinese warfare prior to this period had been dominated by chariots whose riders had to fire arrows, an extremely difficult skill to acquire, which resulted in one state opting for easier to train and cheaper cavalry instead, gaining with it an upper hand until others adopted cavalry too. In military terms, this led to competition over who could run the most effective yet cheap army, resulting in the invention of conscription, standardized army units, and eventually even the formation of an officer corps of military leaders promoted on the basis of merit rather than family lineage or noble standing. War also affected civil development, in that all these state entities competed over who could run the most efficient state to support their war efforts. States started to tax land and harvest, not on the basis of kin group, but on the basis of land and harvest size. Population surveys were introduced to keep count of potential recruits. Conscription offices established, field irrigation and land management offices established, and just as with the army, a system of meritocracy was introduced that produced state bureaucrats hired and promoted on the basis of merit rather than family ties. Intellectually, the Warring States period produced writers such as Mo Tsi, Sun Tzu, Han Fei, Jun Xi, and Kong Fu Xi, who is known in the West as Confucius, and produced the five great classics compiled during the late Zhu dynasty, the Xi Ling, the Li Xi, the Xu Jing, Ai Jing, and Jun Qi. These intellectuals often wandered between different states and helped structure and build different states while writing their philosophies. Through this, literacy became a cornerstone of Chinese administration and society earlier than in any other civilizations, which created a wealthy intellectual heritage on statesmanship and warfare that would become a national treasure and the foundation of Chinese education in statesmanship for millennia to come. As these warring states continued to battle each other and weed each other out over the course of 500 years in a process of survival of the fittest, the state that eventually came out as the most innovative and efficient to then conquer all and unify China was the state of Qin. What happened in particular during the late Zhu period is the creation of the first social structures that we can call a state. Entities with standing armies that ruled territory, bureaucracies that collected taxes and enforced laws, systems of unified weights and measurement, and created public infrastructure like roads, grain silos, canals, irrigation systems, courts, and dikes. Among these states, the Qin would ultimately succeed in unifying China due to one political development that it enforced the strictest, meritocratic legalism. It promoted and hired military officers and generals on the basis of their record and merit, rather than on family ties. The first unified Chinese state that emerged out of the unification and conquest of multiple smaller states was a strict legalist meritocracy. And even though that meritocracy had succeeded in unifying China, it ultimately came into conflict with another core structure of Chinese society, one that had lost this first conflict of unifying China, the Confucian family. We have far less sources to pinpoint and tell the story of early India, since there are close to no written records. What little text we have is religious, from which we do know that the Brahmic religions played an important role in the creation of the first social structures of India. A society of castes developed, called the Varna. These consisted of the highest priest caste, called the Brahmins, then the warrior and ruler caste, the Kshatris, farmers and merchants in the Vaishas caste, and servants within the Shudras caste. All of these castes were divided into sub-castes called the Jatis, and beneath all of them were the Untouchables, divided into Daltis, Hajans, and Pariahs. 
And therein lies an enormous difference between the political development of China and India. China never had a state religion out of which the political structures of society formed. Things such as the famous Mandate of Heaven were less religious concepts as they were state concepts tied to the Chinese social contract. In ancient India, it was religion that structured society and ultimately political development. The elite Brahmin castes did not hold any coercive military or economic power. Instead, they held the symbolic and metaphysical power over ritual and law. The Brahmins also restricted literacy to their own castes, limiting knowledge of religion and law to themselves. Literacy was important in the creation of the first Chinese state and the creation of states in general. It forms the foundation of bureaucracy and the government order through writing orders. Being the only ones who could read did not only mean that the Brahmins had a monopoly on interpreting religious texts and law, but also meant no centralized state could emerge. And the aristocratic and warrior castes also willingly subordinated themselves to the Brahmin caste. Social and economic mobility was additionally severely restricted. If you were born into a specific jati, say a lumber worker, you had to become a lumber worker. You could also only marry someone from a lumber worker family. This system makes the seeking out of further education as well as innovation an unnecessary burden as any further education outside of one's jati is unnecessary. Many historical materialists have made the mistake of describing this Indian society as a replica of European feudalism or as a mere economic structure. But the Brahmin caste in Indian society was an elite without any economic power. Most economic power lay with the lower jatis. A Brahmin who even just looked at a member of the untouchable caste had to undergo an extensive religious ritual of self-purification. In essence, punishing the elite for interacting with the bottom of society. The elites of this society additionally were barred from commerce, yet the lower castes still had enormously restrictive rules enforced upon them which limited their ability to rise through the ranks of society, even if they managed to gather wealth. The religious texts of the Brahmin class also clearly outline that the kings did not own their subjects, but only gained legitimacy through service to the higher castes. All of this makes no sense when applying the standards of historical materialism when interpreting history. For this rigid social structure to make sense, one has to remove one's modern, secular and materialistic lenses and see this society for what it truly was, a religious society built around religion. Brahmic religions see sentient existence as a false perception of reality and the goal of life is to dedicate oneself not to finding and constructing an identity within the false perception of reality, but ridding oneself of all impediments to finding the true reality behind sentient existence. And from within the internal logic of the Brahmic religions, this social structure makes perfect sense. Everything associated with the present life be it the burying of bodies, the butchering of animals, pollution, childbirth, down to the barber, was left to ever decreasing castes. Seen as increasingly impure by how deep their professions were tied into the present life. Through this arrangement, members of lower castes are in fact able to acquire wealth for having monopolies on services such as the ritual cremation of the dead. Upper castes were seen as pure due to them being freed from the need of having to interact with the gritty dealings of the present life that the lower castes interacted with. However, they relied almost entirely upon the lower castes to fulfill these duties for them. And the system of faith that kept it all in place was a belief in karma. If one fulfilled one's social role, one could expect rebirth into a higher caste. In essence, social mobility did exist in this ancient Indian society, but only in the afterlife. The Brahmin castes never centralized around one powerful institution across several princely states like the medieval Catholic Church. 
Instead, they remained decentralized within each of the emergent Indian kingdoms. They owned no land holdings, couldn't raise armies, and were through this completely interdependent upon the ruler castes and the lower castes. What came to be in India was a very unique system of society which was strictly separated and segregated but in which each and every single segment was completely dependent upon all the others and could not act without the others. This was a society with a hierarchy and rules that forced everyone within that hierarchy to cooperate, creating a social dynamic in which the lower castes had substantial leverage and negotiating power, which restricted elites from doing as they pleased. The military structure of these kingdoms strictly reflected the caste hierarchies. Because of this, mobilization of military forces was slow and military rank was mostly determined by caste or bloodline. New military tactics and modern equipment were shunned. The fact that the Indian kingdoms never adopted cavalry archers or the fact that they never gave up on using war elephants long after they were rendered ineffective by pikes, horse archers and gunpowder or modernized its military structure into a merit-based system is why India was unable to defend itself from Greek, Persian, Hunnic and Islamic invasions in the coming centuries. But it also meant that internal expansion by individual Indian states was limited. Unlike China, India didn't form a unified or centralized political entity in its early history. The Qin dynasty was very short-lived. Over the course of the previous 500 years, the Qin state united China, but its dynastic empire only lasted 20 years. The Qin had built a legalist state with an efficient meritocratic bureaucracy that circumvented family lineages in favor of those with the best record. It split the land into prefectures and appointed governors based on merit, while trying to break apart the entrenched family lineages and aristocratic structures of China. Over the course of Qin rule, over 100,000 families were displaced from their land and deported to faraway regions in attempts to break up lineages. It standardized the written and spoken language throughout its domain, thereby creating the foundation of what would become China. The Qin Emperor then ordered the burning of all Confucian philosophy and history books in an attempt to crack down on the ideas forming the traditional family hierarchies. This in part is why Confucian scholars wrote so negatively about the Qin. The Qin introduced an incredibly strict code of law in an attempt to expand and cement their strict meritocratic legalism all across China. One of these laws punished being late with death. And when an army commander in 210 BC noticed he was going to be late and realized that the punishment for being late was the same as the punishment for rebellion, he decided to rebel. That rebellion turned into an uprising that brought down the Qin and replaced it with the Han Dynasty. Let's stop there for a moment because there are two very important things you should learn from this. First is why early state formation makes China unique. This is an aspect that many people outside of Asia overlook or even have trouble understanding. When the Qin collapsed and the Han took over, the Han continued the empire rather than have China divided up into separate kingdoms again. And this is how China would continue throughout the next 2000 years. Yes, it did on occasion fall apart into warring states, but those conflicts were civil conflicts over who should rule a united China rather than wars of dissolving China. China as a state, social contracts, society and political construct has continuously existed for 2000 years. One could even say 3,000 years. There is no other society who can claim this. Yes, you get occasional claims to the past. The French claim their ancestry from the Celtic Gauls and the Iranians claim ancestry to the Achaemenid Empire. But those are claims of cultural heritage, not claims to a continuous social, cultural or political structure. 
France did not exist 2,000 years ago. It barely even existed 1,000 years ago. Iran as a nation state is a construct of the 19th century and has undergone numerous transformations in political and social structure in the last 3,000 years. Compare the history of China throughout the last 3,000 years to that of Europe and you will see what I mean. The political structures, state and social contract developed in China were so resilient and strong that they lasted almost unchanged throughout 3,000 years of social and state continuity, to a degree even to this very day. To illustrate how special this is, imagine the Roman Empire had never split up and stopped existing. Imagine it still existed today and dominated over Europe, the Middle East and North Africa as one singular political and cultural entity within a state. China created the first state. It did so millennia before everyone else did and the structures of that initial first state endure to this very day. Which is why China may be the only country in the world that isn't just a nation state but a civilization state. That the glue that holds China together is something far stronger than nationalism, language or mere ideology, namely its culture. Something that is expressed in the famous quote by the political scientist Lucien Pai that China is a civilization disguising itself as a nation. Second, the establishment of the empire by the Qin, its collapse and its subsequent continuation of the empire by the Han reinforced a continuation of a political conflict of a structure that in many ways endures to this day. The conflict between the state and family, or patrimonialism against meritocracy, or legalism versus Confucianism. Ancient China under the Zhu period had been structured in family lineages under traditions that were eventually formulated into Confucianism a code of conduct by which a functioning family and patrimonialism stand at the center of a society to ensure social harmony. In the Confucian society, the state and its laws are merely tools of assistance to an emperor who, through the moral upbringing by family virtues, should already have the sound reasoning to govern well. The only checks and balances on the emperor's power were not institutional ones, but moral ones. The emperor could lose the man of heaven if he governed badly. The mandate of heaven was not a religious concept, but more of a social contract. The idea behind it was that an emperor could lose the right to rule if he was unable to provide harmony to the empire, i.e. the mandate of heaven. Consequently, rebellion to re-establish the mandate of heaven was justified. The Qin, however, created the legalist state envisioned by Shang Han and Han Fei. In this state, what mattered was merit, education, record and not the family. The law was not merely a guideline, but a strict code of conduct for everyone. It emphasized education in school within institutions of learning and the reliance upon state bureaucracy to serve the state for a greater purpose. Those who rule ought to prove themselves worthy of rule through merit. And that idea of a strict meritocratic state with a well-educated and efficient bureaucracy very much endured after the Qin and is the guiding principle of Chinese statemanship and the main obstacle to Chinese family patrimonialism. These two political concepts remained in competition with each other over the question of how China should be governed for centuries. The Han dynasty kept the empire, it kept its institutions, but Confucianism made a huge comeback under the Han. The bureaucracy of the Han state was dominated by Confucian bureaucrats who did not seek to merely exercise the raw power of the state but were custodians of family lineages and moral traditions. The central government was increasingly institutionalized to facilitate things such as better tax collection and civil control of the army but the Han state did not standardize all of China into a unified and standardized system of governance permitting localized rule through family lineages and traditions to remain. The result was that the centralized state increasingly resembled what we today would call a modern bureaucratic state, but regional governments away from the capital Luoyang remained on occasion almost tribal. 
In a way, the Qin dynasty had pushed its state-building project too far into centralization, thereby disrupting patrimonial regional elites who then rebelled, but the Han then drove their state-building project too much into the opposite direction, weakening the central state into being unable to face off against regionalized patrimonial elites. The Han Dynasty ended up collapsing into the famous Free Kingdom period. That period, in many ways, was a collapse back into patrimonial family power structures, as China collapsed into warring states governed by family clans rather than by meritocratic institutions. This struggle and structure of feuding family clans continued until China was reunited by Zhang Yilang and the founding of the Sui Dynasty. The political power structures created by the Brahmic religions for the various princely states of India had numerous checks and balances, so many in fact that they inhibited the creation of a centralized, powerful and institutionalized state. There were no instruments of mass mobilization that rulers could use to engage in large projects. The main driving force in how India's early society developed were social forces and not political or economic forces. China started creating a strong state to rule society, whereas India created a strong society that prevented the creation of a powerful state. But some certainly tried. Sixteen Indian princely states became powerful enough to vie for power to unite the subcontinent into one entity of which the Kingdom of Magadha was the most successful. Over the course of 300 years, from 600 BC to 300 BC, the Magadha Kingdom introduced a system of taxation within a bureaucracy, replacing a previous system based on voluntary donations by caste to the king. They conquered the Ganges Delta, formed the short-lived Nanda Empire, and then, under Chandragupta Maurya and Ashoka, conquered almost the entire subcontinent, founding the Mauryan Empire in 321 BC. But the Mauryans didn't take the same path as the Qin had. They did not standardize their language as the main language of administration of India. In fact, there doesn't seem to have been much of an administration at all. Offices of governance were attained on the basis of noble birth. There was possibly not even a centralized government at all, and nothing was done to spread education or in any way challenge the system of castes that prevented the establishment of a powerful state. In fact, the Mauryans do not seem to have tried to enact measures of direct rule or even indirect control over the lands they had conquered. Defeated kings merely had to ceremoniously acknowledge the Mauryans as sovereigns, and then they could return back to ruling their own kingdoms as kings in all but name. There was no European-style feudal structure of bowing to superior family lines or land being redistributed by a central ruler. Local property rights were in general not challenged, even by local kings, who themselves under the Brahmic laws only owned uncleared lands such as forests and jungles, and often continued living off voluntary donations by castes. In many ways, the conquered princely states remained independent princely states in all but name. After the death of Ashoka, the Mauryan Empire collapsed, and India reverted straight back into regionalized kingdoms and princely states as if nothing had ever happened. The fact that the Mauryan Empire had existed at all was for a long time forgotten in the annals of history, until stone tablets with inscribed commandments were deciphered in 1915. For Indians, the concept of sovereignty over a unified India did not make sense at the time. The concept of an India united in law and state possibly didn't even make any sense at all. India reverted back into regional kingdoms and tribal politics under a religious social hierarchy, at the same time that a Chinese state started building the first segments of a border wall. One of the key differences developing here between Chinese and Indian political history is that China spent the majority of its history unified, with disunity being an exception and usually resulting in a struggle to reunify while in India, disunity became the standard and the unified India became the exception. 
300 years after the collapse of the Mauryan Empire, the Gupta Empire would be the next to unify India. However, the Gupta were also prevented from attempting to build a unified Indian state structure by the wall that the unified Chinese state had built. That wall made it more difficult for Hunnic tribes of Central Asia to raid China, so they went south, invaded India and caused the collapse of the Gupta. India reverted back to regionalized tribal states and kingdoms again and remained as such for a thousand years. In the 10th century, a series of Turkic invasions coming out of Afghanistan and Iran resulted in the conquest of India by Islamic states. This began a process by which foreign rulers would drive the political developments of India, the first of which was the Delhi Sultanate, which failed. Facing entrenched regionalized tribal structures and social hierarchies, the Delhi Sultanate was never able to fully enforce the structures of an Islamic state over the lands it had conquered. It was forced to govern through concession and compromise with regional Hindu rulers and accept limitations to their political power. And the same is very much true for the Mughal Empire that conquered and replaced the Delhi Sultanate. The foreign invaders may have had the military structure that they had developed from outside to conquer much of India, but their political structures were insufficient in dismantling the social forces in India and to bind them under a unified and centralized political institution. The Mughals became rich and powerful through the control of the Indian spice trade and the Silk Road. They were able to crush rebellions against them with military might, but to rule India they ultimately had to compromise and bend to do so. The structures of what makes an Islamic state ultimately failed and proved insufficient to rule India. The legacy of foreign invasion nevertheless matters enormously in the creation of a unified India. When the Mughals started to decline, someone else from overseas started lurking on the horizon. It is very possible that if outside forces had not invaded and occupied India, that India as the idea of a unified entity would have never come into existence. It is through foreign invasion that the project of building India as a state ultimately began and it began very late. The Sui dynasty did not last long. Its second emperor, Yang, was a megalomaniac who used the power of the state to build a massive wall that caused a famine and even more stupid invaded Vietnam and Korea, which ended in disaster and bankruptcy of the state. A rebellion followed that established the Tang dynasty. The Tang were descendants from a prominent aristocratic family of northern China and they reinforced the system of family appointments within the structures of the states in the Confucian tradition. However, far from providing a basis for good leadership resulting out of social harmony through family traditions, the reintroduction of this system resulted in ever more insepid scheming among families around the royal court to bring themselves into positions of power, culminating with the woman known in Chinese records as the evil Empress Wu, who took control of the royal court through various plots involving the murder of her political rivals, the killing of the heir to the throne, and the appointment of her own son as the heir. Under her rule, the state administration saw most of its Confucian scholars and aristocrats murdered or kicked out, and replaced with loyal agents of her own willing to do her bidding. What we see in this case is how the powerful state that had been created in China could be very well used by an elite to inflict a rule of terror upon the wider country, even against a set of elites who had entrenched themselves through family connections into such positions. Not surprisingly, her rule caused a rebellion that ultimately led to the overthrow of the Tang and the establishment of the Song dynasty, who themselves were conquered by the Mongols who founded the Huan dynasty, which despite despite adapting well into Chinese society, continued to be seen as foreign occupiers and were eventually overthrown in rebellion by the Ming dynasty. The Ming refocused on the building of the legalist Chinese state on a foundation of meritocracy, with the building of canals and their famous foreign expeditions. They also cut the size of the state in half in an attempt to make it more efficient to prevent the establishment of increasingly inept or powerful but still entrenched family lineages in the state bureaucracy, the Ming resorted to the posting of eunuchs as ministers of the state. 
The use of eunuchs in positions of power had been common in China. An assumption was that a eunuch, by the very fact of his living condition, could not aspire towards entrenching and advancing family interests within the apparatus of the state. The Ming created an effective bureaucracy and state around the use of eunuch bureaucrats. The Ming emperors trusted these eunuchs more than any aristocratic families under the assumption that they would not betray them. Over 100,000 eunuchs ended up serving in the Ming dynasty state. The Ming emperors started sending these eunuchs out as spies to aristocratic families and to punish those who may have transgressed in the name of the emperor. By the 15th century, the eunuchs had developed into a massive secret police organization called the Eastern Depot that inflicted a rule of terror upon the country. The emperors lost control over the state institution that they had created. The eunuchs gained increasing control over the royal court, became increasingly corrupt, and the stability of the state increasingly declined, which led to rebellion and the Qing dynasty. What we see here in the examples of the Ming and the Tong is that both a state built on the foundation of Confucian principle, family lineages and patrimonialism, as well as a state built on legalist principle of meritocracy, are capable of collapsing into despotism and state terror. One of the key weaknesses of the Chinese state is its lack of any upward accountability. The Chinese state is a state built around power collecting at the top and at which the authority of the state is acted out from the top to the bottom. The unique development of the Chinese state allowed for the establishment of a highly centralized and very powerful state, a state capable of mass mobilization to build massive projects such as the Great Wall or the modern day Free Gorges Dam or the modern day high speed rail networks, but also a state capable of exceptional despotism and state terror with a lack of most, if not any, public accountability. From the Empress Wu, to the Eastern Depot, to the Cultural Revolution, to the modern crackdowns on any dissent. People who wish to challenge the Chinese state can only do so through slowly complaining upward from the bottom through all the institutions of the Chinese state, to the top of that state. And this means that the state is only as strong as the incorruptibility of its state institutions and bureaucrats. For the Chinese state to function, it must remain meritocratic, but it has to balance that with avoiding despotism, as well as the entrenchment of patrimonial or clientistic interest groups. There is no public or populist mechanism by which the state can be made to change course. The British were the last foreign conquerors of India, and the British understood very soon what the social structure of the subcontinent was. British colonial accounts of India today are often just dismissed away and branded as mere orientalism. But doing that is very silly and self-limiting. These colonial accounts actually reveal a lot about the Indian state that the British created. The British referred to India as a subcontinent of many political entities in which each village is a republic. Far from such accounts being a simplistic assertion of colonial superiority as some may naively and falsely argue today, what it actually reveals is that the British instantly understood the decentralized social structure of India and that helped them enforce their rule over it better than the Mughals before them because they quickly learned how to take advantage of and exploit that decentralized Indian society. The British didn't establish a centralized system of control over India. They established a system of princely states and regions. They made Brahmic religious laws the official law of Hindus and made Islamic law the laws of Muslims. In many ways, the British reinforced the decentralized structure of India while simultaneously keeping control over India for their own extractive economic institutions. They built a modern economy, but not a modern state. However, the result of unifying India on paper into one singular colony had the effect of reinforcing the idea of India as a singular social entity among Indians, even as the state institutions of a united India remained weak. 
and that would eventually lead to the removal of the British and the establishment of modern India. India as a nation-state is in many ways the result of foreign conquests. And this is a very touchy subject. On the one hand, you have British Empire revisionists who will praise the creation of the Indian nation-state as a supposed positive legacy of British colonialism. On the other hand, you will find Hindu nationalists who defend the notion of the pre-colonial Indian village as the foundation of the Indian nation-state. The idea spread by Hindu nationalists is untrue, but the idea that the Indian state that came out of British colonialism in any way reflects positively on British colonialism is also nonsense. The British deliberately kept the administration weak and the state born from British colonialism consequently was a weak state. You will often hear British Empire revisionists talk about English common law and the supposedly great legal framework they left behind in India. What they will not tell you is that the Indian judiciary is notoriously incompetent. Law isn't just built on a theory of law, but on the bureaucratic institutions that enforce, enact, and interpret it. Courts in India are often stacked with paperwork and the line of cases to be heard is immensely long. Court cases can often take years, if not even decades, to finally be heard. It is in fact not uncommon in India for plaintiffs to die while waiting for their case to finally go to court. This is because the bureaucracy of the Indian court system, which is a legacy of British colonialism, was built as a weak and kleptocratic institution. The administration of other centralized government sectors and services does not fare any better. The state has trouble building basic infrastructure, providing healthcare, providing education, and has still to this day not ended illiteracy in many parts of India. This is not due to there being some internal logic of incompetence to Indian culture, but because the Indian nation state was built on the foundations of a weak state. And that state was deliberately kept weak to placate a strong society by the British. India is overall still a post-colonial success story, especially in its economy. But it is a success story despite a British colonial legacy and not because of a British colonial legacy. However, the weak state aside, Indian society has many mechanisms available to resist and change the direction of the state. Indian governments have to frequently placate the demands of local governments to get anything done. And even outside of government, Indian society is a strong society, a society with many avenues of protests and public accountability that can be used to prevent government overreach and despotism. The political history of the Indian Republic is filled with many examples of highly successful regional politicians taking a jump into federal politics and failing miserably. Many success stories built in India are due to regional legacies and efforts. For example, the state of Uttar Pradesh is often noted for having more effective and efficient governments than most other places in India. And we can trace this back to completely different legacies in social structure. For example, that literacy was not restricted to the Brahmins and widely spread across the population in Uttar Pradesh, thereby making governance more effective in the long term. India is also a society in which people can by their own means reach incredible heights and prosper without having to fear any draconian state power preventing them from doing so. You can start a business as an Indian and build that business without fearing the government, but that government is often too weak to provide the education people need to build a business in the first place, or to prevent local gangsters from racketeering your business, or to provide basic services such as a sewage system that you may need to run your business in the first place. As a result of this, Indian success is often built on the strength of its society. People prosper through the efforts of communities and families working together to create success. But with its weak state, India is also unable to build the infrastructure needed and which is the duty of the state to provide to further and secure success by its citizens. In many ways, because India was late to the state construction process, the Indian state is still being constructed to this day.
What happened in the unique political developments of these two societies is the exact opposite process. In China, society was subsumed by the state. In India, the state was subsumed by society. India has a weak state, but a strong society. China has a strong state, but a weak society. India does not have the state capacity for mass mobilization to build massive state infrastructure projects such as the Free Gorges Dam or the world's largest high-speed rail network as China does. But if Chinese citizens were to ever take to the streets to protest the policies of the Chinese state, as Indians often do, they would not find the same success that Indians sometimes do, but would be met with the iron fist of the Chinese state. The Chinese state is absolute and powerful, but it lacks systems of public accountability and can therefore easily collapse into tyranny and abuse of power under the wrong leadership. China faces the challenge of having to provide a place and living standard for its citizens where they either do not see a need for such public accountability or they need to eventually start providing such. That, however, would mean fundamental restructuring of the state and can probably not be done without the collapse of communist rule. Additionally, throughout its history, China faced the problem of clientelism, mainly through family clans entrenching themselves within and subverting the structures of the state. The Confucian family structure is by far the greatest internal threat to the Chinese state. Meanwhile, India faces the challenge of constructing a state that can provide services to its people without cracking down upon and limiting the system of public accountability too much, yet still having to limit them to a degree to not have the state choke out on its society, or far more likely have that society stop the state building process in its tracks. The Indian state in many ways is an unfinished project that is still under construction. In a way, we are privileged to live in a time in which we can bear witness to the process of the construction of the Indian state. And if you are an Indian viewer, you even have influence over that, something a Chinese viewer can only dream of. We may get to see what the Indian state becomes if it comes to be, and if it can find a balance between accountability and authority. Will India find strength in its many societies to shape one large diverse society under a common state structure, or will Hindu nationalism force itself upon the rest of society as a standard of the state at the expense of others? Or will it be something completely different that binds these diverse societies together into a state? With China, we get to watch in our time what the Chinese state will do to placate its society into harmony. We see some of the age-old social and political conflicts acting out to this day. Maoism can be seen in a way through the lens of the Confucian family in conflict with state legalism, as an attempt by the state to subvert the traditional Chinese family structure with the state, something that ultimately failed. And ever since China opened, it is undergoing a Confucian revival as the state is trying to bind the ideas of social harmony through family and obedience into the doctrine of the Communist Party and state. Though China has a weak society, the Confucian family is nonetheless one of the single most powerful socio-economic entities in history. Conservatism in the rest of the world is a system of beliefs that has, despite its name's meaning, constantly had to rebrand and reinvent itself, while East Asian Confucian conservatism has pretty much stayed the same for 4,000 years, and ultimately forced the powerful communist state to bend somewhat to it. You can see Confucian legacies throughout East Asian states, such as in Singapore or in Korea, where right-leaning political forces tend to be more Confucian, while left-leaning movements tend to be more legalist. However, if the reinvigorated Chinese society under the current Confucian Renaissance will be a foundation from which to challenge the state for accountability is yet to be seen. Within our current geopolitical landscape, the conflict over influence and power between India and China becomes doubly interesting with all of this in mind, because all eternal conflicts aside, it poses the question of what is more valuable and important in economic and political development. Is it the state or is it society?
The next two videos on this channel will be an examination of Scandinavian democracy using Denmark as the main example of how a democratic social contract different from those developed in England and France came to be, and a little opinion piece critiquing an American public intellectual who I can't stand. But I will be also taking time off to work on something else. Nomadstar, one of the artists who drew a lot of artwork for this video, has opened his own YouTube channel, and I have been working with him to create a free hour long series telling the history of Quebec. The first part is already on his channel, and as a thank you for his amazing work, I will be working with him on the second part too, which should be out very soon. So go subscribe to his channel, you won't regret it, there even is a preview for part 2 on there already, and I'll leave the link to his channel in the description. I would also like to give a special thank you to my friend, the Korean artist Teabag. I had two rather rough weeks during the last month, during which I couldn't do much video work, and during which he stood up and took over an enormous amount of work for this video. He made more artwork for this video than I did, which feature in over 15 minutes of this video. Amazing artwork at that, probably the best in this video. He also helped us creatively with his ideas and concepts of visual representation of various different state concepts, and he taught us how to draw the correct Chinese symbols while working. Follow him on Twitter if you can, he publishes artwork regularly. Thank you very much Teabag for your amazing work in this video. And I hope to see all of you soon again when I make my next video.